Greetings, friends. My name is Brother Sean Elvis. I'm from Like Christ Minded Fellowship here in Denver, Colorado. And if you clicked on this video today, maybe you're curious to know what the Bible says that we must do to go to heaven. You know, the Bible's a big, mysterious book to some people, especially if you haven't grown up in church. And you know, a lot of religions out there, even within Christianity alone, all the different denominations can make things confusing. But the Bible clearly says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the God, uh, Son of God. So the Bible tells us clearly that we could know 100% for sure whether we're going to go to heaven after we die. We don't have to be doubting ourselves or wondering about it. Um, the Bible clear, clearly tells us whether or not we're going to have eternal life right now, here in this lifetime. So, you know, many people out there think that they have to wait until after they die to get judged, whether, whether they've been a, a good person or a bad person uh, during their lifetime. But in fact, the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, Jesus summarized uh, salvation for us up in just one sentence. He said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, contrary uh, to what other religions out there will tell you, um, they may teach that every other religion out there, except for the Bible, teaches that you have to do something to be saved. Buddhism teaches that you need to give up worldly things and worldly desires in order to reach enlightenment. Hinduism teaches that you need to live a good life in order to be reincarnated and, and move up the ladder and hopefully one day reach uh, Nirvana. And even Catholicism teaches that you have to uh, uh, obey all the commandments and receive all your sacraments. Otherwise, um, you, might end up, you, might not, you might end up in purgatory, okay? Purgatory is not found in the King James Bible. That's the book that I read. It's the original English version, pretty much. It's the official version. But anyway, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, I want to go to heaven one day, especially um, if all my other loved ones who've passed on before me are there. And if you're watching this video, perhaps you're skeptical if heaven is even real, if it even exists, or if, or if the Bible itself can even be trusted. And, you know, those are certainly valid questions um, and concerns, and it's, and, and it's beyond the scope of this particular video to argue why the Bible is, is, is historically accurate and reliable. Um, but, you know, for now, if you would just give me the benefit of the doubt, okay, and assume that the Bible is a true source of truth and knowledge, and it's um, a valid source, and for the sake of argument, at the very least, we're gonna examine what the Bible says we must do in order to go to heaven when we die. Because after all, um, if there was a place, you know, that we can go, a perfect place, right, where there's no pain, no suffering, no lying, no stealing, no murder, you know, everybody just gets along in peace and harmony, would you not wanna go there? <laughs> I, I don't know anybody who wouldn't wanna go there. But how else are we going to get to this place, you know, unless perhaps somebody came from there to tell us how to get there? Well, you know, that's exactly what the Bible is, my friends. You know, the Bible is a book that records specifically the life of a man named Jesus. Okay, Jesus of Nazareth, um, who lived in what's modern day Israel nearly 2,000 years ago, right? He lived, he breathed, he walked this earth. He was a famous preacher. We're still talking about him 2,000 years later. He was tragically put to death uh, for his teachings and his preachings and his beliefs, but he miraculously came back to life after he was dead and put in a tomb for three days and three nights, right? Which he had prophesied prior to being killed that he would do that. Okay, and as far as history tells us, no other man in history except for Jesus of Nazareth has even claimed to have come from heaven, okay? And let alone with such a powerful testimony um, to be believed, okay? And, you know, so much so that even nowadays, in modern 2021, this is the year of 2021, the year of our Lord, and the reason why it's considered 2021 because we're about 2,000 years after Jesus of Nazareth, okay? After he died and 
resurrected from the dead, his impact on the world was so profound that we actually have a whole calendar date based off of this event. So at the very least, I think he earned himself enough credibility to at least listen to what he had to say that we must do in order to go to heaven, right? Since he is, in fact, the only man in history with that kind of credibility to have ever claimed to have come from heaven and he told us exactly how to get there as well. So let's take a look at what Jesus said um, that we must do according to the Bible, uh, that we must do in order to go to heaven when we die. You know, friends, stick with me for a few minutes and uh, I'll explain briefly and clearly, hopefully and concisely, so you can understand what the Bible says we must do in order to go to heaven. You know, hopefully by the end of this video, you too will know for 100% sure, certainty, that you're gonna be in heaven when you die. Okay, so for starters, um, on top of the over 400 prophecies about Jesus that were foretold about him in scripture and in the Bible, before he was even born, okay? It's known as the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, before Jesus was even born, there was prophecies um, that were foretold about him, such as that he would be born of a virgin. Okay, um, all the way up, including his public execution and even his miraculous resurrection from the dead. Okay, you know, well, during Jesus's ministry, he quoted the Bible over and over constantly. Everywhere that he went, he preached the Bible and he seemed to have uh, the whole Bible uh, memorized. Okay, I mean, he just knew it that well. In fact, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. You know, Jesus claimed that he didn't come to change what the Bible said. No, he came to, to fulfill what the Bible has already written about him, okay? In fact, one of the, his closest followers, the Apostle John, um, wrote about Jesus in, in uh, the first opening chapters of John. He said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I mean, he goes on to say a few sentences later in John uh, chapter 1, verse 14, he says, And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So according to the Bible, Jesus literally was the Bible, the word, who incarnated and became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, and, and over and over in scripture, Jesus is always quoted by saying, have ye not read? Have ye not read the scriptures? Is it not said in the scriptures? You know, so Jesus placed a high importance on this book, the Bible. Um, that's, so let's take a look at um, some scriptures from the Bible. Um, and one of the first places and the best places to start is in uh, Romans, okay? The book of Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God so the Bible says that we have all sinned okay everybody who's ever lived who everybody who's living now or who will ever live in the future has committed a sin and they fall short of the glory of God you know and, and what is a sin a sin is defined in the Bible in 1st John chapter 3 verse 4 it says sin is the transgression of the law and you know this transgression of the law this law is not talking about the man-made laws of the government okay it's talking about God's laws the holy laws that God has given us in the Bible you know have you heard of the Ten Commandments you know these are ten holy laws that God has given us and you know so everybody who has, has committed sin. Everybody has broken one of these laws at least one point in their life. For example, thou shalt not steal, okay? Everybody has at least stolen one thing in their life, you know, or, or committed some kind of sin. Maybe it's not stealing, but whatever the case is, you know, so the Bible says that we have all sinned. You know, that means everybody's committed a sin, okay? That's, that's point number one. We're all sinners, you know? Just like the laws here on earth, have a consequence when we break the law? Um, well, God also has a consequence when we violate his law and we commit sin, 
Okay, so Romans 6.23 tells us um, what the consequence is. It says, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. Now, what is a wage? A wage, well, when I go to work at my place of employment and I earn a daily wage or an hourly wage, I am, when I work, I earn money. I earn my wages, right? Well, the Bible says when we sin, our wages of sin is death. So when we sin, we earn death, okay? For the wages of sin is death. But I, okay, so I have to tell you the bad news first, guys, um, before we get to the good news, but the good news is coming, I promised you. But the Bible says, you know, in Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Okay, so the Bible says not only will our sin on this earth, or not only will our sin inherit, uh, inherit us death on this earth, Right, a physical death, but there also will also be a judgment for our soul inside our body after we die. You know, after our physical bodies are dead and gone, our soul is at stake, where our souls will be subject to a second death. Okay, this is a concept known to many people as hell or um, punishment, the lake of fire. And we're going to turn to the last book of the Bible um, in Revelations, a, a, a book that talks about future events and future prophecies. Revelations chapter 20 verse 14 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Okay, so the book of Revelations uh, talks about a second death. So not only were our, will our physical bodies die one day, but we, our soul will be judged and be subject to a second death in hell as punishment for our sins. Okay, Revelations chapter 21 verses 8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and check this out all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death okay so the bible has a list of sins here but notice it says all liars will have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death okay this lake of fire is also known as hell right so jesus talked us talked to us about hell uh quite a bit and you know the worst thing about hell is that there's no escaping it okay it's an eternal judgment okay jesus said this about hell in matthew chapter 25 verse 46 he said and these shall go in to an everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal so jesus referred to hell or the lake of fire as an eternal punishment, okay? That means it lasts forever. It's a punishment that never ends. You're constantly on fire being punished for your sins. It's the worst and most scariest uh, punishment imaginable. Mankind cannot even devise uh, such a thing because we're talking about an everlasting punishment, okay? But enough of the bad news, okay? That's the bad news. Now we're gonna get to the good news, okay? The good news is God loves us, okay? He doesn't want anybody to go to this place of eternal and everlasting punishment. Um, in fact, he didn't create this everlasting punishment for humans in the first place at all. He actually created that for rebellious, fallen, and wicked angels like uh, Satan, okay? He doesn't want us to go there. Um, so he created and invented a way for us out of this second death so that we don't have to experience that so that we can just die in our physical bodies and then go to heaven and live with him after we die and i can prove this in uh, romans chapter 5 verse 8 the bible says god commendeth his love towards us in that well we were yet sinners christ died for us christ died for us because he loves us so god sent his only son um Jesus down here to die for us because he loves us as a way to escape the second death. Now, we can't do anything about the first death. We're all going to die in our flesh and, uh, one day and our physical bodies are going to perish. But God loves us. He loves us so much that he sent his one and only son, his perfect holy son, down here um, to pay our punishment for us. Okay, the Bible says that even though we sinned, 
For the wages of sin is death. We earn death. We deserve this punishment in hell. We deserve the second death, okay? But God loves us so much that he sent Christ to die for us, okay? Christ chose. He willingly chose to take our punishment, the punishment we deserve upon himself, and he willingly took our punishment for us so that we don't have to, okay? This is why Christ is called Christ, okay? Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is a title. It means Savior. He is coming to save us from, from what? From this lake of fire, from the second death, so that we don't have to go to hell, okay? Well, um, now how is this possible? How, what qualifies Jesus to be our Savior? Well, for starters, he was born of a virgin, okay? He wasn't born a sinful, uh, of a sinful man like we are. Okay, he came from heaven above. He was holy and he, uh, from the beginning, from the very beginning, he was conceived immaculately, holy, okay, without blemish. That means without any sin. And not only that, he lived a perfect life and never once sinned his whole life. Okay, so Jesus, um, even though he was a flesh and blood man, just like we are, he had a body, a physical body like we do, he was human. But he was also God at the same time. Um, and God never once sinned, never once told a lie, never once even thought a bad thought, okay? That's what qualified him to go to the cross and willingly take our punishment upon himself because he didn't deserve any kind of punishment. He was perfect. He was holy. The Bible says he didn't have to die. He could have called down legions of angels at any time to come and save him. <laughs> okay, and stop everything and he could have went back to heaven, no problem. But he didn't do that because he loved us and he wanted to lay his life down for us. You know, just like if I was in trial at a courtroom and the police were charging me for, let's say, speeding. Okay, I, I got caught speeding on the roadways, you know, and if somebody came into the courtroom and said, hey, I want to pay Sean's uh, speeding ticket for him so that he doesn't have to, then he can pay the judge and walk free. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. He was taking our sins upon himself. He paid the price. When he was crucified and was died and buried for our sins, he was, he was, in, he was in the tomb for three days and three nights where his soul was cast into this hell, the second death, okay? But unlike us, he escaped it, okay? We would not be able to do that, but he did. He miraculously came out of the grave, resurrected from the second death, overcame it, defeated it, and physically walked out of that grave to prove that he is the Christ. He is the savior of the world. He's the one who paid for our sins and conquered death and conquered the second death, okay? And he returned back into heaven where he currently is right now, waiting until he returns again. But here's the thing, friends, just because Jesus came down here and died for the sins of you and me and the whole world, past, present, and future, um, that doesn't mean that everybody automatically is gonna go to heaven, okay? Because um, Jesus said this, he said in Luke chapter 13, his apostles asked him, Lord, are there few that be saved or is the whole world gonna be saved? And he said, uh, in verse 24, he said, strive to enter in at this straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able, okay? Many will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. Unfortunately, not everybody's going to be saved. Why? Why will not everybody be able to enter in? Because they are not going through the straight gate, okay? The word straight gate just means narrow pathway. There's uh, a broad way that leads to destruction, Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, he said, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there will, uh, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Okay? There's a narrow way to heaven. Okay? And not because it's difficult to get there, it's because not everybody wants to go this narrow way, okay? They want to find some other way to get there for whatever reason. So the question is, what is this narrow way that we have to go to get to heaven? What is the narrow way to reach the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus said this in John chapter 3, verse 3. 
He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again. You have to, we have to be born again to see the kingdom of God. Now here's the thing. If I can't see a place on the map, or I can't see a place um, <laughs> on my GPS phone, or, or you know, I can't find a place and nobody else can find a place, how, we can't see it where it is, how are we going to get there, right? How can we find it? Well, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God, let alone get there. So here's the question, um, how do we get born again? That's something we need to answer, right? Well, Jesus tells us how to get born again because he wants us to get born again. He says in John chapter one, verse 12, he said, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. See, when we get born, into this lifetime, we are born into a family, okay? That's why we are given a family name. It identifies us, which family we come from. It's usually, uh, we call that our last name or our family name, you know? Well, when we get born again, the, the same thing happens. We become a new, we become a, uh, a part of a new family, a heavenly family, where our Father in heaven becomes our new Father, okay? Or our, our, our born again Father, if you will. But in order to become the sons of God or daughters of God, whatever you want to say, we need to receive him. Okay, we need to believe on his name. It's not about giving, uh, giving God something. It's about receiving something from God. The Bible says we need to receive something. We need to receive him. Who is him? Jesus Christ. We need to accept. We need to uh, receive the Savior. Okay, um, and how do we do this? Well... We believe on his name. We believe on the name of the only begotten son, Jesus. We can't believe on anything else but Jesus. We cannot believe in Muhammad, okay, or Buddha, or Zeus, or any other God or religion out there. Um, and, and you know, even in fact, we can't even believe in our own self, okay? We have to believe in Jesus. He is the only way. In fact, in Acts chapter four, verse 12, um, the apostles themselves said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And obviously they were talking about Jesus. Jesus himself said in John, John 14, verse six, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So what happens to those people who choose not to believe in Jesus, who think that they're going to uh, choose some other way into heaven and not follow the straight gate. Well, um, John 3, John chapter 3 verse 18 says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So in this verse right here, we have two possible outcomes, okay? We have one situation on one side saying a person who believes in Jesus is not condemned. And on the other side, we have somebody who does not believe in Jesus, but they are condemned, okay? So <clears throat> what is the deciding factor according to this verse on who is condemned, or excuse me, who is condemned and who is not condemned, okay? now. Did Jesus say, whosoever is a good person is not condemned? No, no, notice salvation has nothing to do with um, how good or bad we are. It has to do with what we believe. They believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's why they're not condemned, okay? Well, the other people did not believe they were already condemned to the lake of fire, right? Because of their sins, they have already deserved that. They are not saved. So how do we get saved from the second death? How do we avoid the ultimate punishment for our sins in hell so that we can go to heaven after we die? Well, the Bible answers this very clearly. We have to believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And, and just to clarify this point, with the, one of the most crystal clear verses in the Bible, Acts chapter 16, verse 31 says, um, and this took place shortly after Jesus had already uh, resurrected from the dead and ascended back into heaven. 
some people heard about it and they wanted to know. Um, so they were asking the followers of Jesus, the apostles, this exact question, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says, uh, and they brought them out and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, just according to this verse alone, does this uh, say that we have to be a good person to be saved? No, no it doesn't. Does it say that you have to go to church every Sunday to be saved? No, no it doesn't. Does it say that you must turn from all your sins and stop sinning and stop uh, whatever wicked sin you're doing? No, friends, it says believe. You just have to believe something, okay? Um, you don't have to prove, you don't even have to prove anything. Um, you just have to believe something. Now, what exactly is it you have to believe? Believe on the Lord Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean to believe? And what exactly do we have to believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, let me explain this. You know, anything, or excuse me, anybody can believe in Jesus, right? They can believe that there was a man from, uh, um, from that part of the world that existed. His name was Jesus, right? He was a historical figure. He had a real person who actually walked and talked. Um, they may even believe he was a holy person, a good person, right? Um, that would be believing in Jesus. But let me tell you the difference between believing in Jesus and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ means that you trust him alone for your salvation, okay? You believe that when he died on the cross, he was paying for your sins, okay? And you're not trusting or believing in anyone, not even yourself, for your salvation. You're trusting that what he did on the cross was payment sufficient enough to save you. Okay, so again, why is what we believe so important? Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. You know, even if we have believed in Jesus, that we might, or excuse me, um, this verse tells us that, you know, there's no way that we can justify ourselves by the works of the law, okay? Or by following the commandments, right? Remember, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, for the wages of sin is death, right? So there's no other possible way that we can justify ourselves other than faith in Jesus. In other words, we have two options, okay? We can either believe that we can somehow justify ourselves by doing some kind of good works, by living a good life, by following the law that we've already bi violated, by the way, okay? But we can try to believe that, hey, we can follow the law, that's how we can justify ourselves into heaven some way. Or option two, the straight and narrow gateway, we have faith in Jesus. We don't have to do anything. Now, I wanna note here that the Bible isn't telling us not to keep the law, not to follow the commandments that, of God's holy law, right? It's not telling us to go out there and steal and kill people. No, no, no. Of course we should follow the law. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. But to be justified in the sight of God so that you can go to heaven, there's no law that you can keep because we we already broke the law. We already violated it. We already deserve punishment. So the only possible way to save ourselves from that punishment is through faith in Jesus. Or, to put it another way, what we believe personally. Remember, when I when uh, when we started, we read Romans 3:23 for the all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now let's read Romans 3:24, the next verse. It says, "But being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Okay, so if we want to have remission of sins, if we want to be forgiven for the sins that we've done in the past and the sins that we will uh, commit in the future and be able to stand before God holy and sinless, there's only one way to do that. 
there's only one way. We need to declare the righteousness of God as our own through faith in Jesus, okay? We cannot earn our salvation. We cannot, there's no prayer we can pray, right? There's no uh, atonement that we can atone for. The only way is by faith in Jesus. And notice, notice it says that if you want to be justified and, and declare the righteousness of God as your own, you must believe in Jesus. We can't earn our salvation. It's a free gift. It's a present, okay? Have you ever received a present? Now, this is the final point that I want to make. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I want to talk about the present that God has for us, the free gift, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so the Bible says that, well, first of all, what is grace? What is grace? Grace is when you are given something that you didn't earn or you, you didn't deserve it, okay? For example, if I were to give you um, this Bible right here today as a gift, because I love you, right? I say, hey, I wanna, gi <laughs> I wanna give you this Bible as a gift, you didn't earn it, you didn't work for it, you didn't pay me for it, but just because I love you, I want, I want to give you this gift, okay? That would be grace. I graced you with a free gift, okay? And the Bible says that we are saved by grace, right? Right? Um, we are saved by grace. So we, didn't, we don't deserve to go to heaven. In fact, we deserve to go to the lake of fire, but through God's grace and mercy, okay? Now, what is mercy? Mercy is not giving you something that you do deserve. Grace is giving you something that you don't deserve. Um, but anyway, God sent His Son, Jesus, to die in our place, to suffer our punishment, what we deserve on the cross so that we don't have to, okay? And through faith, meaning that if we believe and we accept God's grace, God's gift, God's present as a free gift, then there's no room to boast, right? Nobody's going to be boasting in heaven that, hey, I am in heaven because I went to church more than you, or I read my Bible more than you, or I followed more commandments than you did. No, because everybody goes to heaven the same straight and narrow way. How is that? Through faith. It's simply what you believe. You accepted the free gift, the grace of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You got born again. You were born into a new family. You have a, a, a father in heaven now through your faith, through what you believe that Jesus did on the cross for you. Salvation is a free gift, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23. Remember we started with the wages of sin is death, but the second part of that verse says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So according to this verse, God has a gift for us. What is it? It's eternal life. Eternal life, okay? Let's say that if I gave you this Bible as a gift, right? Eventually, one day, this Bible is going to break down. The pages are going to fall off. The ink's going to fade, okay? Whatever the case may be, it may, it may, it may get burned. It may get uh, stolen or, or, or broken, but God has an eternal gift for us, okay? An eternal gift that lasts forever. Eternal life. Now, if God gave you an eternal gift, how long would that last you for? It lasts you forever, right? That's the definition of eternal. It means forever and ever, everlasting, in heaven, life with the Lord, in His holy kingdom, okay? Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever received a Christmas gift at Christmas time? And um, let me ask you this. Who pays for the gift? Uh, at Christmas time? Is it the person who gives the gift away or the person who receives the gift, right? Well, the person who gives the gift is the one who pays for the gift, right? That's how they paid for the gift. It's theirs and then they give it to you for free. That's what a gift is. So God has a gift for us. It's eternal life. Now, who pays for it? God. God would pay for the gift, right? Because he's given the gift away, eternal life. Now, how did he pay for it? How did God pay for that gift of eternal life so that you can have it? Well, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to come down here, live a perfect life, okay? He died for us willingly on the cross. He didn't have any sins 
uh, to pay for, right? So he was able to pay for our sins because he didn't have a debt to pay, okay? And he took the punishment that we deserve and he went to hell for three days and three nights for us. And then, miraculously, he resurrected from the dead. So all of our sins are paid for. The gift is already paid for. It's already there on the table. All we have to do is accept it and open it up and believe it. Okay, that's all we have to do. So salvation truly is that simple, my friends. It's as simple as taking a drink of water. <sighs> Very refreshing. The most refreshing drink that you can ever take is the living water that Jesus offers us absolutely free. Okay, so now let's say you're hearing this message right now and you believe it, right? <clears throat> At what point does this gift belong to you? Okay, how much do you have to believe? Well, Jesus answered this question. He, in John chapter five, verse 24, Jesus said, verily, verily, that means truly, truly, this is true. I say unto you that he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. According to the Bible, if you're hearing this message right now and you're truly believing it in your heart, you have everlasting life right now, right at that moment, the moment that you hear the words and you believe it in your heart, you have everlasting life that fast. That word hath everlasting is an old English word. Uh, it's a presence tense word. It means right now. You have it right now, that fast. The moment you hear God's word and you believe in Jesus uh, in your heart, you are saved. You have the gift of everlasting life that fast, okay? So let's say you, right now, you're hearing the words, you're believing it in your heart. How exciting. You're getting born again right now. Amen, hallelujah. God bless this message, you know. But my last question to you is this. Is it possible to lose this gift? Let's say you receive the gift right now, you have it. How long will you have it for? Is it possible to lose this gift maybe down the road and you might somehow lose the gift of eternal life and not make it into heaven? Well, let's answer this question. Can God take away your eternal life from you? Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever received a Christmas gift and somebody later on came and Maybe you made them mad and they, and they came back and took your Christmas gift away, okay? <clears throat> now, after you hear it and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you receive the gift, let's say you do some wicked sin, okay? Let's say you murder somebody and you really make God upset, okay? Can God ever come back and take away your gift from you? Let's answer this question. In, in Titus, the book of Titus, chapter one, verse two, the Bible says, in hope, of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Listen, just like I said, when you get a Christmas gift and somebody gives it to you, they're not gonna come back and take your Christmas gift away from you. And if they do, what does that make them? A liar, maybe a thief, <laughs> maybe a jerk, whatever you wanna call them, right? Um, see, the thing is, when God gives us the gift, the gift of eternal life, it's the same thing as a Christmas gift, okay? Um, and notice in this verse it said, God promised us this gift before he even created anything in creation. God promised us a gift, eternal life. He said, I promise this to you, okay? And notice that the Bible says that God can't lie to us. So if he promised us something, he's not lying to you. So let me ask you this, if God promised you something, eternal life, and he gave it to you, and you have it. And he said, all you have to do is hear it and believe it, and it's yours. That easy. You hear it, you believe it, it's yours. He can't take it away from you, friends, because he promised it to you, right? Because if he took it away, wouldn't that mean that he lied to you when he said it was yours, okay? See, when God promised something, he gives it to you and you have it. Now, he's not gonna take it away from you. You know, he wouldn't, he would have to break his promise I'm gonna pause the video. Unpaused. Okay, so when God promises something, okay, he gives it to you, you have it, and he took it away from you, you know, he would have to break his promise, right? He would have had to have been uh, lying to you when he promised that it would have been yours. 
Is that making sense? You know, you see where I'm going with this. I'm trying to make it clear that you cannot lose this gift. Once you have this gift, it's yours and it's yours forever. Eternal life lasts forever. So once you have it, you can't lose it, okay? Once you hear the words and you believe in your heart that Jesus died for yours, the gift is yours forever. Friends, um, here's my last and final point. I just wanna make one last point before I close this message. Um, let's say that you receive this gift, but one day down the road, for whatever reason, you wanna give the gift back. You say, I don't want eternal life anymore. I don't wanna to go to heaven anymore. Curse God, curse this Bible, curse whatever, okay? and you wanna give your uh, gift of eternal life back. Is that possible? Let's an Jesus answered this question in John 10, 28, I believe. He said, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my Father's hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Okay, let me put it this way, friends. When you're born for the first time, you have two parents, right? You have your mom and your dad, right? They will always be your mom and your dad, right? No matter what sin that you commit, you can go kill somebody, you can go rob a bank, you're always gonna have the same mom and the same dad, right? Those two people will always be your parents. Well, the same thing's true with God. When you get born again and God becomes your heavenly father in heaven, he will always be your heavenly father and you will always be a child of God. You are God's child now. You belong to his family and there is nothing you can ever do to change that. You know, just like with your physical family here in this earth, if even if you wanted to curse your parents and curse your mom and dad and say, you're not my real mom or my real dad, you cannot do that because by blood, you are always your uh, um, their child, okay? And in the same way, you cannot get out of God's family. Once you're in God's family, even if you were to curse God and say, you're not my heavenly father anymore, I don't even wanna to go to heaven anymore. You can't do that, friends, because here's the thing. Are you greater than God? No, no, the Bible says no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand, and we are not greater than God. So even we ourselves cannot pluck our own self out of God's strong hand. Once you become a child of God, you are in the hand of God. And we are not even greater than God to pluck our own self out of God's hands. Okay, does that make sense to you? So here's the thing. Um, you may be asking yourself, so Sean, are you teaching me that I can just live however I want, commit whatever sins uh, that I want and still go to heaven and still be saved. All I have to do is believe that Jesus died for my sins. Well, in short, yes. But uh, I would like to answer that question by saying, listen, when you're a child, okay, when you were a child and you, and you were under your parents' uh, household and rules and authority, right? And let's say you did something bad, okay? You did something bad and your parents punished you for it. Maybe they grounded you or spanked you. Now, did they punish you because uh, they hate you or because they love you? They, pu they punish us because they love us and they're trying to teach us a lesson, right? Well, the same thing is true with our, our Father in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12, verse six says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now that word chasteneth is an old English word. It means punishes, okay? Not punishes because he's mad at us, punishes because he loves us. Just like our parents punish us when we make mistakes. Listen, when you become a child of God, the Lord loves you. He wants the best for you no matter what you do. You cannot lose your salvation, okay? But just like our parents, when we disobey, we might get punished a little bit, right? It doesn't mean we're out of the family, okay? We can never be out of the family, but they might wanna teach us a lesson and correct our behavior so that we can have a better life, a more prosperous life. Well, that's exactly what, Jesus, uh, what God will do to us. He might punish us a little bit to teach us a lesson, okay? He may, he may even kill us and just take us right home to heaven and strike us with lightning, whatever the case is, okay? But there's no way that we can lose our eternal life. Okay, just like there's no way we could stop being our parents' child. Does that make sense, friends? Now, friends, I'm, I'm glad you made it this far in the video if you have. And, you know, 
um, there's no greater uh, decision or choice that you could make in this life, in my opinion, than to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, become a new creature, okay? Be born again so that you know for sure, 100%, that when you die, you will go to heaven. It gives you, it fills you with hope. It gives you inspiration to move forward in life. And, it, and it's just such a blessing to know that God, the creator of the universe, the most all-powerful, all-loving, loves you enough that he died and sent his only son to die and pay for our sins. Now friends, that's, that's my Bible way to heaven message today. If anybody preaches to you any, uh, anything different, it's a false gospel. It's a false message, okay? There is no better message than this message that I'm preaching to you right now for a reason, because it's true, okay? And salvation is by grace, through faith alone, in Jesus, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So don't let anybody be boasting to you that they're better than you. Salvation is a free gift by through faith of Jesus. Friends, if you've heard this message today and got saved, God bless you so much. I'm so, I'm so happy for you. It's a glorious day. The angels in heaven are surely rejoicing. And um, I am ultimately humbled and proud to have been able to present this message to you in a clear understanding way so you can get saved. And I hope that you continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But for now, I will close again with the most famous verse of the Bible, John 3, 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friends, God loves us so much that He gave us something something very valuable, something very precious. The most precious thing that this world has ever seen. The sacrificial, loving, graceful blood of Jesus Christ. And he gave it to us free, as a free gift, because he loves us so much. And eternal life is right there for you to take, okay? You don't have to wonder anymore where you're going when you die. Because Jesus proved it. He proved how much that he loves us. He proved that we have nothing to fear. He conquered death. We have nothing to fear. Our Lord took our punishment that we deserve for us. All we have to do is accept it. All we have to do is believe on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Accept his free gift by faith. Friends, if you don't do anything else in your life, you make all other bad decisions. Make this one right decision. Put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Get saved. You have nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain for all eternity. Friends, that's my message. That's the Bible's way to heaven. This has been Brother Sean Alvis from Like Christ Minded Fellowship here in Denver, Colorado. May the Lord please bless this message and bless the person who hears this message. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Amen.